streaming. Got it. Okay, welcome everyone to our next Water Wetlands and Watersheds seminar. Um, apologies for those of you who didn't know it was going to be virtual. We'll try to do a better job of that next time. But we are lucky enough to have our uh, a colleague and friend, Sandra Guzman, is um, presenting for us today. So I'll introduce you and then you can share your screen, Sandra. So Dr. Sandra Guzman is an assistant professor in the Department of Ag and Bioengineering. She's at the Indian River Research and Education Center in Fort Pierce, Florida. Any of the undergraduates, are you from Fort, Fort Pierce? Anyone been in Fort Pierce? No? Been there? It's a nice stop. I mean, I know the stop on the turnpike, right? <laughs> Dr. Guzman has a PhD in biological engineering from Mississippi State University and an MS and BS in agricultural engineering from Universidad Nacional de Colombia. Her research program involved the impl implementation of sustainability solutions for agricultural water management. And she also has a robust extension program that focuses on improving uh, growers, stakeholders' capacity to make informed water management decisions about crop production using knowledge and data based approaches. So Sandra, thank you so much for presenting to us today and go ahead and share your screen. All righty. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, being in person and online uh, today. Um, so uh, let me see, um, let me know if you can see my screen before anything else. That looks good. Okay, perfect. Uh, so today uh, I will talk about a little bit of uh, challenges and opportunities in terms of implementing precision uh, irrigation uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, but I will focus on the work and the progress that we have been doing with um, here in our research um, uh, and extension um, lab uh, in Fort Pierce. So you will hear uh, a couple of uh, examples for citrus production. Um, I was planning to give you a little bit of uh, the taste of uh, sweet corn and vegetable production, but uh, I'm gonna leave it for later. So um, before anything else, uh, let's talk a little bit about, okay about uh, precision irrigation and what is uh, smart um, precision irrigation. So um, smart and precision irrigation have been used uh, mostly like recently over the last 10 years and the, uh, it's gaining a lot of popularity in terms of uh, improving the efficiency uh, of crop uh, management practices. So in this case, we will focus on water, um, and, and nutrients, but mostly focus on water quantity. So um, when uh, when we talk about smart irrigation, uh, similar that's uh, cell phone, we think about uh, having apps uh, or having uh, internet of uh, things based systems that can help us um, make a decision or that is giving us directly a recommendation. So. Um, over here, uh, you will see multiple options. So you will have sensors. Uh, you will have um, you will have um, uh, apps, and uh, these kind of systems are basically available for use. So I'm not going to focus on apps or drones or images coming from uh, basically data coming from above. Uh, I'm going to focus more than anything else on uh, the use of sensors, which are kind of the uh, precision agriculture um, um, sensors that are mostly used in the state of Florida. So um, if you have questions about why I'm not focusing on smart apps, uh, if we have maybe smart apps available, uh, we can discuss that after, after the presentation. I will be happy to talk about it. Um, so in terms of precision irrigation, uh, mostly precision irrigation is related to variable rates. So when you hear uh, variability or uh, variable rate, we are talking about precision irrigation. So in North Florida, 
uh, systems uh, with a center pivot irrigation and raw crops, uh, let's call it uh, soybean corn and all of these um, uh, um, cropping systems can be managed with precision irrigation. Uh, so they are, uh, these systems are based on soil variability, plant variability, weather variability. So the image that you see here on this side have multiple, uh, multiple soil types and a precision irrigation and a precision management system should be able to give uh, the precise amount of water for this soil, for this and other soil and for the rest of the field uh, separately. So that is the difference kind of between, uh, between precision irrigation and the similarities between precision irrigation and smart irrigation. So uh, these kind of tools are tools available for the decision making process. So I want to stop a little bit here and uh, and say um, and ask you to to think as a plant growing person. You may have plants in your house, potted plants, and um, and you may have had questions on when to water it. Uh, what happens if the leaf is yellow? What happens if you see a nut or a little pest or something like that. So having information for the for to decide if uh, you should put more water, less water, more nutrients, less nutrients, um, is kind of uh, what uh, precision uh, irrigation is made for. So in terms of opportunities uh, for adopting uh, precision irrigation, um, we have uh, three main opportunities. Number one, uh, having access uh, to real-time data for decision-making. So if we have a body plan at home and we have real-time coming from multiple systems, uh, data coming from multiple systems, then it will be uh, way easier to make a decision and to see how, uh, how to manage those nutrients and that water efficiently. Um, at the same time, if we if we have a better use of, do, of that water and, and, and nutrients, then we can increase economic benefits. And here is kind of the uh, well-being if we are moving from the potted plant at home to an agribusiness, having the um, increases in economic benefits and um, and basically societal well-being is kind of the goal of these kind of systems as well. And uh, indirectly, we can work um, with, um, with nutrient movement because if we reduce the amount of water applied, then uh, the, uh, the nutrients are moving less into uh, fresh water systems. So we can reduce or could reduce runoff and leaching if we incorporate only precision irrigation practices or a smart irrigation practice. So, um, Talking about access to real-time uh, data for decision-making, um, I just realized that this is not, uh, something happened with the PowerPoint. So this is an older version of my presentation. I apologize about that, but um, in terms of having access to real-time data for, uh, for the decision-making, this is, this is a picture of what kind of sensors and what kind of systems a farmer could have in their field. So they have many sensors, including the rain gauge and all of these sensors in the field. On top of that, they may have an infinite number of sensors. We don't know how many, but uh, all of those uh, are systems that the farmer will, uh, will have uh, to manage nutrients and water. And this is only nutrients and water. So. In your potted plant, you may uh, you may have uh, a soil moisture sensor like this one, for example, just to see what is the water status of your plant. And then you may have to have, uh, um, if your plant is outside, you may have to have a weather station. If your plant is inside, uh, we can make an assumption that um, um, that uh, the thermostat in your house is kind of uh, controlling the temperature and controlling the humidity of your house. So then you will have to check, hey, uh, the thermostat in your house, the soil moisture um, app in your cell phone and try to figure uh, and try to figure what is the water status. So for the farmer in this case, uh, they will have to check 
if the weather station is from one brand, they will have to check for um, um, with the with the software with that company, like how is the weather looking like, and then moving into the software for soil moisture and check the soil moisture in this case. So they will have to move into what is happening with the rain, what is happening with the relative humidity, what is happening with the soil moisture. So then uh, the challenges start right here because um, the the data transfer uh, and uh, and the data visualization, number one, is in multiple platforms. Number two is being managed by the company. So if, uh, if the company makes an agreement with the farmer, uh, then the company is, um, is managing that data. Uh, some companies own the data, um, even if the farmer is the one collecting the data, other companies uh, may have, um, may have um, some agreements where uh, the farmer owns, owns the data. Um, the other the other challenge and uh, Daniel uh, Palacios, one uh, uh, one of uh, our technical assistants here, works with that is that uh, the installation of sensors uh, is difficult. Gaining trust in the sensor is difficult. Doing troubleshooting, I mean, we have to do troubleshooting. Uh, frequently because uh, there are there are things that could happen with the sensors. So um, all of all of those uh, troubleshooting and maintenance uh, issues have to be uh, basically have to be an extra load for the farmer. So they have to become technicians if the UF IFAS system is not with them. Um, other challenges is that Usually, uh, we work with the extension office, and the extension office is key in the transfer or whatever technology we we create uh, into the field and into implementation. And then they they work for not for six months, nor for two days. They work for many years with the farmer, uh, showing the sensor, showing the system, establishing trust. Uh, like processes of trust, basically. And then a new release of the latest and greatest technology that the super smart engineers uh, bring up to the market uh, um, uh, appears. So the learning process will start again for both the extension agent and the farmer. So the learning curve kind of gets reset if we have if we incorporate new systems that are just prescriptive systems, I will leave this um, discussion for the end for sure. So does everybody know what extension is like I know our ag student friends know what extension is, but does anybody not know what is extension? Okay, I've got a couple of hands here, Sandra. So we've got people who don't even know what the capital E on extension even means. So just maybe give us. Oh. A minute. <laughs> Beautiful. What a wonderful opportunity to talk about extension. So uh, extension is teaching and is teaching students that are, will be five years old or 80 years old. So it's unconventional teaching. So basically transfer knowledge that is creating from research up to the industry. So in this case, transferring whatever knowledge uh, you are doing as uh, as a student or all the scientists at the University of Florida are doing, um, transferring that knowledge in words that uh, anyone can understand and in uh, educational programs that can be implemented to uh, have either um, higher economical well-being, social well-being, or better uh, environmental impacts. So. Uh, in terms of um, of water resources, we we are looking for higher uh, yield from the ag side. Uh, we are looking for uh, ben uh, environmental benefits, so uh, red or reduction of the uh, impacts of any ag practice into um, into the environment. Not sure if yeah. that was clear. Is unconventional teaching, but uh, basically we we talk, we, we sit with people, we sit with agencies, it's not only the farmer, uh, there are industries, uh, there are the, um, basically um, 
uh, local offices or any decision maker uh, that wants to and um, learn about the technologies that we have. All right, thanks so much. Yeah, um, so uh, the goal in general is that uh, the decision support system, the software, the technologies, the innovations that we are creating uh, should be easy and practical enough to be implemented by a farmer or to be implemented by, let's say, an economist or uh, that is located in Tallahassee or being easy to use uh, for, um, yeah, for, uh, for someone that has a background that is not in engineering. So for example, a horticulturalist or uh, someone that does ag education. So these kind of systems should be uh, um, should be easy to understand and practical enough that can give us the opportunity to really transfer the new technologies that we are developing. So uh, our team, in our team, we started uh, we started uh, developing um, a decision support system that is called um, Eric Monitor. I hope I can I can show it to you. Okay, so it's going over there. So in Eric Monitor, we have a simple display. It looks super simple. It's not simple for a new user. So remember that you are in your grower, farmer, or um, mindset, and you see this kind of image. So this is the common image that a farmer see when they want to know the soil water status of their field. They see a bunch of graphs mm -hmm. without having an engineering background. And they have to make a decision in less than 30 seconds so they can move on with their lives. So I hope you made the decision already. Uh, uh, so um, here again. <laughs> How much? One inch. <laughs> Why? I don't know. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So if we, if we, we may irrigate one inch, two inches, three inches. So we may, even if we have this information available, we may rely on our own eyes as the best sensor to say, well, it's kind of dry. I'm going to put water um, and I'm going to put it until it looks the soil looks wet and that's pretty much it. But what about utilizing this? So um, so the extension office back again, uh, they, uh, they have been working with farmers all across the state of Florida to help them understand what these graphs mean. So um, over here on top of the display, we have soil water content. So how the water status of the plant uh, in the lower side, we have electrical conductivity. Nobody knows why electrical conductivity is here. Farmers are not using it up to now, but it's something that is available. Many companies have that available. So uh, coming into the upper side for uh, soil water content, we have um, two graphs over here that represent the upper upper and lower sensor across the soil profile. So in this particular case, the farmer has two sensors at two different depths and is showing us the water status of the soil. So focusing on the ups and downs on this graph, any up represents water application. So we may uh, we can see uh, can say that here there was an irrigation event. So they apply water here. And the yellow one is the bottom sensor. So in the lower side, uh, the red one is the upper sensor. So we have more water coming from, uh, uh, more water in the lower sensor and less water above. So um, it, may, um, it may happen that uh, the farmer irrigate and then the water move or that there is water table moving from below. So one or the other case. We start looking at electrical conductivity at more detail because electrical conductivity or volumetric ion content is a representation of the salt uh, content of the soil. So um, 
our hypothesis, and I will I will show you a little bit about what we did, um, is that hey, if we have a fertigation event, fertigation is basically where um, where uh, you mix fertilizers with water. If we have a fertilization a fertigation event, uh, we may see spikes in electrical conductivity after that fertigation event, and by just having a soil moisture sensor we may be able to, uh, to assess where the nutrients are going, if they are staying in the field or if they are going to, um, uh, to the Indian River Lagoon uh, in, in the case of where I am located. So this is one of the displays. Uh, we work with this system um, uh, with three farmers. So this is a collaboration with farmers. Uh, the farmers had outdated systems and they wanted to have the the latest technology. Uh, so we started we started with uh, with this display system for them. Then they told us we hate the graphs. You are an engineer. You are always showing us the graphs, and we hate graphs um, and equations. Yeah, they never want me to show a graph or an equation. So I was like, okay. So what do you want? Um, mm -hmm. So we incorporate this system that uh, uh, over the left side that basically is telling you what is the status of your soil moisture at the moment um, um, where, where the sensor is measuring. So over here, if you see green, uh, that green color means that the, that the water status of the soil is okay. If it goes to yellow or to red, then water has to be applied. If it goes above the blue up to the up to the purple uh, line, then we have overwatering or uh, the effects of a hurricane season or an extreme rain event. Um, so we start showing only this part, and then they became familiar. They like it, but they wanted the graphs back. So they were like, "Okay, uh, we like it. We know how to use it. Now we want to see more details." So because of that, uh, we work uh, multiple displays. So we have a total of five displays. This, this is the most basic display, but we have five displays that go from uh, more familiar systems to less familiar systems that go from rapid movement of water to slow uh, uh, movement of water. Um, this system is also uh, a system that helps, especially with this overwhelming issue. And you may have lived that in your own like life, day-to-day -day life, when you have like the smart light, the, the smart thermostat, the smart thing, and 20 apps in the in the cell phone. And it's like, oh my gosh, I have to go to this app to uh, update it, to move here, to move there. So uh, the idea with this particular system is that we have, uh, we can have sensors from multiple companies uh, just uh, providing us a se uh, sending the data up to here, up to this software, so we can have a full spectrum of what's going on with all the sensors, weather and, uh, and water related um, in only one platform. So uh, at this point, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Three growers are testing this system and they are giving us a lot of comments uh, and, um, and we are coming back and forward with them trying to inc uh, improve this system. Uh, this system is still uh, incorporating, for example, the weather forecast as part of, uh, of, uh, this, uh, of, a, um, of the decision support system to, uh, to help have, uh, to have an image in terms of rain. Um, but uh, we are all, um, we are also using ERIC Monitor as a system to have uh, educational programs, centralized educational programs that can go all across the Strait of Florida and the multiple range of environments, crops, and, and knowledge. So if we can have one system, we will have one educational program that will go for industries in North, Central, and South Florida. So that is what we are using ERIC Monitor for. Then uh, in terms of the second challenge uh, of increasing, well, the second opportunity more than challenge, uh, increasing water use efficiency and uh, economic benefits, um, we continue working with farmers here in, um, in the Southeast um, 
part of, uh, of Florida. And uh, we started a collaboration with us, with a lemon farm uh, grower, uh, and we started this project in 2019. So it's the, the fourth year of the project. And uh, just evaluating uh, best management practices. So um, um, the ground cover, you see uh, that there is a comparison in this picture between bare ground and ground cover. So uh, this ground cover, um, the farmer basically basically put like I think at the time fifty acres of land with this uh, with this black ground cover. Uh, to protect the root system from a pest uh, that is the, uh, called the diaprepi root weevil. Uh, that was the idea. But then uh, our team went and helped installing soil moisture sensors and um, an automation so they could manage their irrigation from their cell phone. And, and then we saw these ground covers and uh, we start asking what is happening, like what is going to happen with the water and with the water movement, if the irrigation system is micro sprinkler, so uh, a micro sprinkler irrigation system basically uh, works as a, uh, as a as a little shower or a little rain on top of this plastic uh, ground cover. So the water is coming from above. The cover is not coming from below. Uh, the same with nutrients; everything is coming from above. Um, so we start doing an, uh, the evaluation of physiological responses, or we start evaluating where the water was moving, where the nutrients were moving, if the nutrients were really passing through this uh, this ground cover or not. Uh, just just as a clarification, the ground cover is not 100% plastic; is uh, a blend of wood, plastic, and other materials. And is needed in a way that that is what the company said at the time that let pass the water, that let pass uh, nutrients and all of that. So we start testing that. Um, this is this the results that I'm showing here are from uh, 2019 up to 2021. Uh, we just received the um, the results for 2023. Uh, we ended up analyzing that uh, recently, but uh, it's pretty similar to um, to the results that we are uh, that we got in 2021 with a little caveat. Um, so the bars that you see over here uh, are uh, canopy volume. Um, we work with um, with trees in a commercial field. So the only thing that was changed was the, the water application and the cover itself. So our team was calling the farmer every week, um, giving recommendations of water application for the ground cover and for the bare ground. Over the four years, we track Number one, the farmer decision. So mm -hmm. if we recommend two hours of water, did they apply two hours or four hours or three hours? Or uh, did it up, did they apply more frequently, less frequently? So we, we, we start working on collecting data on how the communication process between the researcher and the farmer went. Uh, at the same time, we evaluate physiological development, so plant growth. In this case, you are seeing a uh, trunk uh, diameter with the lines here and uh, canopy volume. So consistently, we have seen, uh, we had significantly higher canopy volume for the cover treatment compared to the uncovered treatment. Consistently, we had a higher trunk diameter in the cover treatment compared to the uncovered treatment. Uh, what this means that is reducing that the ground cover itself and uh, the irrigation management that we are doing is uh, is helping uh, reducing the stress of the tree. Having less stress helps with uh, at the time we were thinking that helps with uh, with higher yield and it did. Um, with the results that we got last year, we also have significant differences. Uh, um, in yield, so we have uh, this is weights uh, per 
three. So basically, we uh, we collect um, uh, the weight uh, the weight per tree, and we did comparison between the cover and uncovered treatment. And we found that um, that the cover treatment was having higher, like highly significant um, um, uh, weight compared to the uncovered treatment. So this part uh, was kind of the most important part for the farmer. After this moment, then then we start the conversation of, okay, soil moisture sensor irrigation works the ground cover work, uh, like whatever system that your researcher uh, are putting in your mind are really working because we increase yield, which represent economic outcome in a, a significant level. Um, some things that we have pending in this study is uh, over here, you see the differences between the cover and the, un uh, the uncover and the cover treatment per repetition. We had five repetitions and one of those repetitions was giving us like um, very extremely high uh, yields. Um, it turns out that um, the soil in this area is a little bit different and that can be a high influence uh, on the responses that we are seeing. So. Um, um, other results, uh, I mean, we have to incorporate the soil variability into the equation. We were not uh, including it at the time. And uh, the, the last one, so precision irrigation could reduce uh, runoff and leaching. Um, so one of the things that that we are seeing besides these these issues with uh, with the displays or the information and how the information is being practical or not for the farmer is that there is there is a lot of data uh, being being collected in um, in this in the with with these sensors and with the software, but there is a data overload at the same time. And uh, one of the data overloads uh, that that the farmers are getting are related to this electrical conductivity and volumetric ion content. Um, so, if you remember the 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 short uh, video that I made that I show at the beginning, uh, there were some peaks in soil moisture and some peaks in electrical conductivity. So, our hypothesis for this particular study. Um, uh, was that electrical conductivity, values of electrical conductivity may be able to track the movement of phosphate or the movement of nitrogen uh, or nitrates uh, in the soil. Um, so um, our team went and collect a soil port. All of this study was made uh, in the lab. Um, uh, and it's a study on progress. So I'm not going to show you like conclusions over here. We are still working on this. Um, this, uh, this core was, uh, was collected from a field that is called the salt block. So it was irrigated uh, at the time, like I, I think seven years ago with uh, ocean water. So high levels of salt in this particular core. And then in the middle, it has a soil moisture probe. So each one of the lines that you see over here is one, uh, is one sensor. And then uh, the core was set vertically and solutions of water and phosphate uh, were applied. So a control uh, with the still water, uh, 10 parts per million and 100 parts per million of phosphate um, were applied into this core. Um, then the measurements uh, from the sensor were made every 30 minutes and we work uh, this core for 24 hours. After the 24 hours, uh, the core was basically um, the multiple samples for each one of the lines that you see here were sent to the lab to see where the phosphate was for uh, comparison. We also had a controlled soil that is 100% uh, sand, pure sand. So a little bit of uh, the results that we uh, that we got from this uh, preliminary study yeah, are over here. So um, you see how graphs can be so overwhelming. 
So the farmers have the same all the time. So this set of overwhelming graphs uh, on the right side uh, are showing soil moisture. On the left side are showing volumetric ion content uh, or uh, uh, electrical conductivity, let's put it um, um, as well. Um, they, they are related. Um, the upper two are showing the upper layers of the soil, the, the lower two, the lower layers of the soil. So each one of the colors represents one of the sensors uh, across the profile. So companies that, um, that work with these, uh, with these sensors now are, are telling the farmer that um, if they look at this data, and if the volumetric ion content and the soil moisture are decreasing at the same time, that means that they are losing nutrients, that the nutrients are moving down or um, they are getting out of the area where the sensor is located. And vice versa, if, uh, if the volumetric ion content and the soil moisture uh, increase at the same time, it means that it's gaining nutrients. So based on this, uh, on, on this core particularly, we see, we saw that at this time we had losses in the upper layer and gaining gaining on nutrients at the lower layer, and that's pretty much what we got. When we went into the statistics, nothing was conclusive. Not even um, not even the um, the results that we got from the lab. So there are so many questions that are open here for this particular set of data. Uh, we are now, instead of focusing on how, how the volumetric ion content or how the salts go up, we are now focusing on when those salts are moving from one side to the other. So we are switching kind of the graph uh, and moving the y axis up to the x axis and vice versa. So we can really um, have an idea of what is happening uh, in terms of time, because in terms of the spikes, uh, the the sensor itself is not being able to um, to sense um, uh, the the movement of um, of uh, phosphorus all across the profile. So. As I mentioned, this is a work on progress. Uh, we have to work on strategies to highlight better uh, what is happening with volumetric ion content. Definitely improve the visualization platforms. If volumetric ion content is not the answer, it, it shouldn't even be uh, available for visualization. Um, uh, we um, we are also calling for researchers that develop app, uh, develop sensors and researchers that are working on developing uh, phosphorus and nitrogen sensors to incorporate those sensors in the systems that are already in the field. So if a farmer already have a soil moisture sensor and they are familiar with it, what about if we incorporate the phosphorus sensor over there? What about if we incorporate the nitrogen sensor, not have it separately, so we can prevent this uh, overload? So as I mentioned, an optimal water management strategy should have a technical, a socioeconomic, and an environmental um, balance. So it should, it should have uh, the balance between those three in terms of technical, we have the sensors, the software, the automation in terms of socioeconomic. Florida has some incentives and subsidies so the farmer can utilize the technologies. But if we can prove with the technical developments that uh, yield can be increased, that's great. In terms of environmental, we have limits, regulations. We have, uh, we have a, a little bit of work to, uh, to connect what is happening from the environmental side and what is happening with, uh, with the crop production side in order to have a big picture of where the nutrients are moving and if the solutions that we are creating are really useful. So in terms of challenges for adoption, we have to keep working on increasing the trust of technology efficiency from the farmer. Uh, we have to start thinking about systems that, that are user inspired and that have the end user, in this case, the farmer or the decision maker, 
as the one testing and as the one evaluating this, uh, the, the technologies that we are developing. Uh, so we can move on um, in terms of um, uh, progress and to, and to do a better manage of water and nutrients. And, um, and finally, uh, having, having systems, having these systems that are user inspired will help us also to incorporate, um, to transfer this information to the environmental agencies uh, to say, hey, these systems are really working. Uh, we are having, we are moving, um, we are doing a good job on managing uh, nutrients at the field level, or we are not doing a good job on managing uh, uh, those nutrients. But uh, that that connection between uh, the environmental and the crop management has to be there. And the extension office and the, the ones that are transferring knowledge to lay back audiences are the ones that are key in this, uh, in this work as well. So with that, I'm gonna leave a little bit of room for questions and we can continue discussing um, uh, this, um, um, this topic. But if you want to take a, like let's say a take home message, uh, as researchers, uh, we really have to think about the end user and who is going to use the solution that we are trying to uh, to test and provide when we are developing any kind of uh, technology. Uh, if we continue creating uh, solutions, in my case, that are from engineers to engineers, I mean, we will have to have one engineer perform at least so we can prove efficiency. All right, thank you, Dr. Guzman. Let's give a round of applause. So I'm gonna bring you back here. And so you're projected on the screen, just aware. I'll, let's see, we'll go to the gallery. So, um, and we'll take questions, questions from the room first, and then I'll check the YouTube and the Zoom. So start with any student questions, please. Yeah, go ahead, Pietro. So uh, I was curious about with that, um, the fabric kind of mulch covers. So you had said that they're originally there to prevent weevils and that the results were showing that there was a higher crop yield um, with the covers. Do you think that could have anything to do with weevils? You know, like, like they're doing their, their original job? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we in in this in this we collaborate with the root biology lab next door so uh we also install rhizotrons that are basically uh, that are tubes so where you put 360 cameras and that 360 camera gives you an image of how the roots are growing and if there is um any sign of stress from the roots so comparing the uncover and the cover treatments uh, we got in terms of uh, um, main roots, we, we did not have significant differences. We were expecting significant differences. Uh, the reason why we think we did not have significant differences between the ground cover and the bare ground is that the bare ground uh, was, we, Basically, the, the five trees that we got per repetition, we have a total of 50 trees uh, for all the repetitions, uh, were surrounded by, um, by the ground cover. So that was that is our hypothesis. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot talk a lot of details about, uh, about uh, the, uh, the root uh, physiological growth, but definitely there was an influence. Um, we okay. did not find we did not find that there were uh, that there were significant though. Um, in terms of in terms of water, uh, last year especially we found that the uncover treatment, uh, the one without uh, the cover, actually um, had a better water use efficiency. 
and we were asking why, uh, it was because the farmer forgot to weed uh, that year uh, the, for multiple months. Uh, they didn't weed uh, uh, the uncovered treatment, and those weeds serve as a mulching system. So they were actually helping us with water savings. They were competing in terms of nutrients with the tree. So we have losses in terms of nutrients because they were going to the weeds. We were gaining in terms of water savings. So um, it's a really good question because we also have to take in account the trade-offs between, okay, what is going on for pests, for nutrients, for water, not only one uh, response. Thank you. All right, other questions from Zoom. Quiet YouTube, so I'll go to a question in the room. So, I remember several years ago, you know, about the time that you know, crop circles were going in and, and everyone, and they seemed to be just great, but they used a lot of water. And so they came up with more precise um, use of the water. But then water use actually went up because the farmers were putting in more units since they had more water that they could spend in their allotment. And so there's obviously um, not much loyalty to the um, concept of saving water. So some yeah. do you think there's kind of like, you know, perverse incentive, you save the water, so then you just expand that, you extensify, you know, because you, you become more efficient. So you don't end up saving at the landscape scale. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand to the question very well but let me let me let me rephrase because I, now i have two two sides of the question so uh trade offs between hey having too much efficiency and then too little on the environmental side that was the question oh, or yeah. the question was or the question was that hey we have so much water that what's the point of focusing on saving water well um the farmer has an allotment, and and so they use that allotment of water. And when they find that they're saving water, um, they then expand their crops so they they can use oh, okay. that additional water. And so that doesn't say much about their interest in saving water as a um, a globally good thing to do. Well, the in at the point I think is that where the environmental side comes to play. Um, if there is a water allocation, but at the same time, the crops are expanding. Yeah, there is there is higher efficiency, but we are not going to see the outcomes in terms of the environmental side ever, because basically crops will continue expanding and expanding, or we may have a higher um, higher plant density, for example, that, that it happens. Um, um, so this is, this is something that we have to continue working on and incorporating uh, measurements like, okay, we have the total maximum daily loads. We have, we, have, we have some information, really good information from the environmental side where we, are, we know that uh, there is a limit as well. So besides the water permit or the water allocation, we should incorporate other, other measurements uh, um, into the equation that are, that are not being incorporated at this point. Um, the, in terms of, of production, I mean, if you have if you have an agribusiness, you will you will tend to be as optimal and as efficient as possible, um, expanding your business as much as you can, of course. So I think you'll see this a lot across all of the all of our presentations. There's like the carrot and the stick. This is like incentivizing or making you know uh, better decisions available and perhaps supporting them, like paying farmers to use these technologies versus the stick, which is there's a regulation and you can't do this. You can't grow this much, right? And so there's this trade-off where when you incentivize and make things more efficient, that's great. But if it's unbounded, then they just be more efficient everywhere and you can expand the footprint. Same with development, same with anything else. And then other folks that might want to sit over here and say, well, the farmers are ruining everything, so we're going to just stop doing, right? 
and then you're going to regulate out an entire industry when you're not going to. And so there's you're going to see like bouncing back and forth camps that think you should incentivize smart technologies versus camps that think you should stop activities. And um, we can do more research like continuously, continuously about this. You've seen it, right? All right. Any last questions? Yeah, for and Please go ahead. And, uh, and and the other thing, I mean, we can continue with this precision act technology, and in, uh, we 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 didn't we didn't talk about AI and machine learning, which I mean, I came I came to the area to work in machine learning, and look at me, I'm I'm still in the sensor side. Uh, so, what if we continue with this efficiency process and we get fully automated? Then, uh, if we have full automation, then we will have uh, we we will have everything fully controlled, and then that that will that will uh, help us having higher pro uh, higher yields, higher production, higher everything, and uh, everything accounted for. Uh, but the social well-being uh, is something that also have to be uh, to be uh, taken in account. So, um, um, carrot and the stick for sure. Yeah. All right, let's give another round of applause to Dr. Guzman. Thank you. For the next week, I'm pretty sure I'm like 99% of sure our virtual. Next week, we have Devi Kajam uh, Pankeni. He's uh, also from one of our uh, research and education centers. So I'm pretty sure he's going to present virtually. You're welcome to come to the room. If you come, let's bring some snacks. If you're going to come, you like watching TV, right? Uh, but otherwise, you're welcome to watch it on Zoom. Uh, and we'll, uh, I gave some comments to some of you all on your write-ups, just about a little bit about form and content. So please check out those comments. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you.